All right, this is Wyoming Base. This is GT and Tristan. We are interviewing Curtis Stone, author of The Urban Farmer, and best known from his uh, very successful YouTube channel. I've watched that for like maybe the last five, eight years, something like that. I can't even remember. How's it going, Curtis? Great, great. Happy to be here, guys. Awesome. I think the first question I want to just jump into with you is um what are your thoughts on youtube as a platform today you have like i don't know half a million subscribers on there um to me it feels like it's kind of gone fully establishment <laughs> that it's a bit of a that youtube's kind of a what's left is me is kind of like a, a hollowed out version of what it used to be and i kind of wanted to get your your take on that because you've been in that yeah. for so long yeah, well, no, I I could go on all day about it because I've been on there 10 years. Yeah, it sucks. It sucks. The only reason I post there anymore is because I have, you know, almost 600,000 followers. So my views there, I still get more views there than anywhere else. But um, I, I should, you know, a channel my size, I should get. 50,000 views every time I post a video that's that because that would that would still only be 10% of my followers seeing my content that would seem like a reasonable you know algorithm or analytic uh but I don't my my views get um a hundredth of the followers so so my my <clears throat> my views on YouTube are like 5,000 views for my when I post a video in the first 24 hours I have 500,000 subscribers. So it's it's a hundred, it's one to a hundred views per subscribers. It's garbage. It's complete garbage. Whereas I'm posting on Twitter and my my average views of videos I post there are getting one to one. So I only have, I'm almost actually at 6,000 followers. It's growing quite quick on Twitter. I just got on there in June. Um, so I just think Twitter's the future at least for the time being. I mean, these platforms constantly change and get compromised. And we've, I've certainly seen that on YouTube. Um, yeah, YouTube is just, I mean, it's Google. So, you know, it's, it's complete uh, establishment, woke, censored, you know, it's, it's anti-free speech. Um, they're, they're, they're demonetizing content creators like myself nonstop. So if you're if you're just a homestead channel or off-grid channel and you just post just that content and you kind of stayed the course and you're using clickbait, you're probably still getting lots of views. Um, but if you're talking about the new world order like I have, uh, you're done. And so, um, you know, even guys like Doug and Stacy off-grid, he's been fully demonetized now. So he was making a lot of money on his YouTube channel. Now he's fully demonetized. So it's a significant uh, revenue hit for him. My channel, my channel still is monetized, but I saw the writing on the wall with YouTube in 2016. Yeah. And then I started transitioning to things off YouTube. And then in 2019, I, I, I launched from the field TV. And then that's kind of changed um, to Freedom Farmers. We still do from the field TV. It's just it's going to be integrated into the Freedom Farmers platform. So I, I've you know I've taken my career off YouTube a long time ago. So all the things that are happening now aren't. I'm not being caught off guard by it. It's not any surprise. I complain about it every now and then because I've been on the platform for ten years and it sucks that my 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 videos just don't get that much views. But at the end of the day it doesn't really matter because I diversified my platform into my own. I diversified my, diversified my income into my own platforms many years ago. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, but no, I'm, I'm definitely like I, I, all the effort that I'm putting into YouTube still, cause I will continue to post there. Cause like I said, I still get some views there, but everything I'm doing on YouTube, I'm doing on Twitter now. So all my videos are going to be, are, are going onto Twitter. I'm also on rumble. I'm, I'm posting on everything that's on YouTube is on rumble now. Uh, and it's actually still transitioning a lot of my content because I have thousands of videos or, or at least a, a th over a thousand videos on YouTube. And so all those are being mirrored to rumble right now. It takes weeks actually to do it apparently because it's all automated, but it takes time. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my take on it. I, like I said, I'm reluctantly there. 
Um, and I'm, I'm setting up myself in other places so that when they decide to just fully disappear my channel, which I wouldn't be surprised if they did at some point, then I'll just be, you know, people can find me on Twitter and rumble. Yeah, that's something we've definitely talked quite a bit about and, you know, have been concerned about YouTube from the start of when we started posting for Wyoming base, which is pretty, you know, just earlier this year. And, you know, my large largest following is on Twitter X as well. And and it seems like they're kind of Elon's embracing this and he realizes it because for the first time in, I don't know, yeah, like a decade, all these social media conglomerates are actually having competitors in the market space. I think it's a good thing, but I'm yeah. curious for you, how you see it playing out and, you know, what do you, um, you know, what do you value about Twitter and X, obviously free speech in general, but how do you kind of see it evolving over the next couple of years? You know, Rumble as well is kind of like very, very early, but it is curious to get your take. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll see. I mean, a lot developed even yesterday. I was I I I tuned in on that Twitter Spaces with which was epic. It was like I was it, it was surreal. It was Alex Jones gets reinstated, and then all of a sudden he's on a Twitter Space with that dude Mario or something. which has a huge following on Twitter. He does Spaces, and they get massive views. So he's on a Space with him, and then. You know, Andrew Tate's coming in. Mark Dice is on it. Elon Musk shows up. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy takes a piss while not meeting his mic. It was hilarious. Um, yeah, it, it, <laughs> it's it, 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 it's it's pretty cool. I mean, you know, uh, it is what it is. I mean, I I like to be hopeful about these things when I see that kind of stuff because I use Elon Musk's products. I can't, you know. People, a lot of truthers in in my kind of space will call him the Antichrist and all these kinds of things. And it's like, okay, well, maybe. Um, I just try not to get too invested in any individual. I just invest in my land and my my thing. And so it's like kind of like hoping for the best, planning for the worst. So I think, yeah, I think it'll be a gravy train for a while. I think right now Twitter looks like it looks like an all new social media platform. Because you know how you know, there's been all these kind of waves of social media. There was, you know, I, I was born in the late seventies. So I, I, but, but I was in my twenties when it was Friendster and MySpace and I was using those things. And then it went to, you know, then it was Facebook came in and then Twitter came in shortly after. And then that was kind of a second wave and Facebook's still in that that second wave but then when they integrated Instagram they went kind of third wave and now Twitter seems to be cuz it's just so different than it was it seems to be an all new platform and so i think there's going to be pretty big opportunities in it and and i it seems like as far as a business game Elon Musk is playing a good game i mean i would not want to bet against Elon Musk in any <laughs> sort of technology enterprise because he's obviously a massive industry leader so I think it looks like, yeah, Twitter is going to be the place. And hopefully it, it 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 stays good. I think we'll at least we'll have a number of years where we get a good run at it. Because, I mean, you, if you just look at the money, he has to get a return. And so he doesn't, let, let's say Elon Musk is evil and he wants to just pied piper everybody into something and then cordon us off, which I could, you know, wouldn't rule out. Uh, but at the same time, on the money side, he's at least got to get a number of years in there where he's getting big quarters and making profit in order to, to get to whatever the, the the alleged end of the game is. So I think I think it'll be yeah I think it's a good opportunity. Rumble's crazy. I, um, I'm surprised actually how many views Rumble gets. I, I was on the Grand Theft World podcast with Richard Grove late last night, and he's getting ten times the views on rumble as he is on youtube so wow. rumble seems to be good too and so i think it'll yeah it'll be a matter of time till i just kind of switch everything there because i might just get to a point where youtube's just not even worth my effort anymore though they do still give me money but it's <clears throat> it's legacy money it's all from my old videos mm -hmm. and that's one thing that's kind of neat about youtube and that the space that i was in for a while is that my my type of content gets what's called a long tail effect and you hear this referred to in the record industry and music industry is that you know there's there's 
pop music and things like that that get this like mass and it's the same with viral content gets massive views on the first 24 48 hours that's where it makes 99 percent of his money and then it just kind of disappears into the void you don't really see it again nobody watches viral videos that are 10 years old so but my content has this long tail effect where it just kind of goes like this but then it just stays the course and so some of my oldest videos are still what's making me money on youtube and it's not significant at all. YouTube is an insignificant part of my revenue streams these days, but it is there. So I'm thinking, you know, let's, let's diversify. I'm not making any money on Twitter yet. I'm not monetized there, but I'm just the engagements there. And so I'm going, well, this seems to make sense. It does feel like um, Rumble was the alternative. And as YouTube was, you know, demonetizing and kicking everybody off, everyone was going over to Rumble, but to me, it feels like over the last, I don't know, six months or, or, or less that, you know, Elon Musk and X has just kind of kind of taken center stage. It has. It's just crushing. It's crushing everything. I mean, there's no and, and, and maybe they'll throttle it at some point, but I don't see any other platform that gets me that en much engagement. I mean, it, I'm getting, like I said, one to almost one to one from followers to view count that's really good i mean it, i i was an early adopter on facebook and i was um i was in there and i had i was monetizing it and i was advertising on facebook in the early days and in the early days of facebook ads it was crazy you didn't have to spend very much money and you got really good engagement and even organically you could get good engagement um, and then they obviously throttle that back and then want, and then make you pay to get the rest. It seems like right now, Twitter is just giving you everything that's there. So if you have X amount of followers, they're seeing your videos, if they're following your channel or your, your, your page or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to ride that train as long as I can, but you know, I, I'm kind of, you know, I've been doing all this stuff for a long time. I've been a content creator for 10 years now. And so I've been doing it. Um, I was farming kind of three years prior to starting to make videos and then I started making videos. So I've, you know, I've been doing it, this stuff for quite a while and I'm at a point where I don't really want to make content forever. I kind of just like to disappear, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'd like to just live on my homestead and just do my thing on the land though i think i like conversations and 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 so i'll probably continue podcasting whatever it's going to be and i'm not saying i'm going to throw in the towel right away i'm not i'm still making videos actively making one today and but um yeah i think in the future for me it'll just be doing uh podcasts and and i really think the twitter spaces platform is a really good one for that. I mean, I look at the engagement, it's insane. That 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 Twitter space from yesterday with with Musk and Alex Jones has got tens of millions of views already. So it's like that's something. Yeah, sometimes it feels uh almost like we're kind of in Atlas shrugged and everything's dystopian. Yeah. And, and I I don't try to put I don't want to put too much on any one guy, but doesn't it almost feel like Elon Musk is like a John Galt sort of thing? Absolutely. It does. It does feel like a John Galt. And and part of that cliche makes me skeptical of it because Dang. it's like, it's too good to be true. It's, it's, it's too, it's too much of a Hollywood story perhaps, but maybe it's not, you know, the thing that I often arrive at, cause like I've been a truther call it for 24 years I've been on this path of learning about how the systems work and my dad red pilled me when I was really young or in, in my when I was 20 basically I'm 44 now and so I've been on this path and it's so easy to fall into this trap of thinking that everything is controlled opposition it's kind of like there's a gradient scale of how deep of a truther you are at first you take the red pill and then you're like whoa whoa there's some crazy stuff going on but you're not you're not thinking everything's evil yet and then you kind of go to the black pill and then you think everything's evil and it's all fucked and every and everybody's gonna everybody's out to kill you and it leads to real paranoia and then you get to this point where everything's controlled opposition and you're peeking out the blinds to see if they chemtrailed today and you don't want to go outside and you know <laughs> what i mean you you get you get so paranoid that in a way you almost go full circle you kind of turn into what the covid cult were during all the lockdowns and like you don't want to go outside because people aren't wearing masks you can almost get that deep as a truther and so i try to just go 
I kind of throw caution to the wind. I don't invest in in individuals. I invest in myself and my family and my farm. And I kind of hope for the best and plan for the worst. And so whatever it will be, it will be. Uh, it doesn't matter to me if Elon Musk is the Antichrist or not. It's like, well, the platform's there. A lot of the people that criticize him the most are still using his platform. So they're they're logically inconsistent in some ways. And so I just kind of go, well, the, the the reality is in the world that we can all observe easily is that things are always more complicated than you think you are. You know, you might think you know a lot about holistic land management with, with farming, and then you get out there and you start doing it and you start realizing, well, there's certain things I didn't learn about that I have to figure out. And so the world at large is that way. And so to assume that just because you watch some David Icke videos that you you know all the answers to all the the deep esoteric stuff that's been going on for thousands of years would be uh, a limiting belief. It, it would be a cognitive bias because you just don't know. You have to really get in there to figure things out. And so I would assume it's the same thing with Elon Musk. It's not all um, black and white. It's not all just this side or that side. Things are probably really complicated and nuanced, and we don't have access to that information. So how could we assume that we know one thing or the other? Yeah, I think it's really important because, I don't know, GT and I have both been on this journey, and you can definitely get neurotic about a lot of things. Um, and yeah, we just don't know and diversifying and having that skepticism, but then also putting in kind of that proof of work to make yourself more sovereign is really what yes. you can do. That's all you can do at the end of the day. And then you can be happy and whatever happens, happens, you know, who knows. And one of the most important aspects of that is definitely being sovereign from, you know, a land perspective, from your food perspective. Uh, which is what you've been teaching for 10 years now. So I guess transitioning a little bit into that is, you know, how do you tell people, and you've made a lot of videos on getting started and things like that, but what do you think the most important first step is if um, someone who wants to become more sovereign, grow my own food, live off the land, what's step number one to get into this? Step, step number one is analyzing your own context. And so what, what, what I like to tell people is do a resource analysis of the things that you have, the things that you're good at and the things that you like doing. So uh, because everybody's path is going to be different. And so, you know, whatever the context is for you, you know, if it's just living on the land and growing your own food, that's just one piece. Um, if it want, if you want to actually, pursue liberty in the sense of say the, the the americana idea of liberty you know perhaps it's sort of um it's an element of agorism you know agorism is the idea that you live with the least amount of interaction with the state there's kind of a whole litany of things you can create sort of a very colorful mosaic of what one's life looks like if they're free and so i would say it's really take a check, like make an inventory list of the things that you have. And so you can go down the list and say, what skills do I have that can help me on the land? Okay, what are they? Oh, I, I know how to run a chainsaw. Um, I can fix a truck, um, you know, things like that. Okay, oh, now, uh, then it could be, well, I'm fairly good at gardening, growing annuals. I don't know a lot about perennials or whatever it is, you know, you kind of go down your your own sort of idiosyncratic list of, of what it is that you have. And then it goes into physical resources of what you have. Um, and then you put that together and then say, this, this is, the, this is your own holistic context. And then from there, then you start to look at what are the barriers to take for, for me to get to the next step of these things. So, okay, I don't live on land right now. Maybe I'm living uh, I've got a, a rental and I've got a backyard. I've been gardening for a couple of years, whatever it is. Okay, what's the next step if I want to get on a bigger land? What does that look like? Okay, well, if I don't have a lot of money, I got to take these steps. And so to say people should take one step or the other is really impossible to say um, and give somebody real advice on because everybody's path is different. And so that's why I would say start with you. And then kind of figure out what your context is, what you like doing, what you're good at, what you have, 
And then when you can find things that align, like this has been the sort of the magic trifecta for me, is that when I can line things up in the sense that if I'm naturally good at them, and I enjoy doing them, and uh, I have some of that already, then that's, that's a sure bet to start leveraging that thing. But another thing too, is to to also first address weak links. And so this is even a thing that goes on the personal side, but then it, so go, it goes super micro to your body. And then it goes super macro to say being on a quarter section of land is that, that if you don't address the weak links first, those weak links will be exposed anytime there's an unpredictable event that happens in your life or on your land. And so you could say, well, it, you know, one weak link could be your diet. And, and that might actually prevent you from being successful on the land because you might be subject to certain vices that are harming you. And sometimes it takes, it really takes a really good analysis of just being honest and, and, and even talking to loved ones and getting critiqued by people because your loved ones, if they care about you and want the best for you, they'll give you honest advice, especially if you ask for it. So you can do that. But then when it comes to things on the land, always addressing weak links first, you know, and so one example with that uh, on land would be, you know, say you've got uh, a driveway that every springtime, a certain part floods over because you didn't ditch it and didn't put it in the proper culverts or whatever it might be. That's a weak link that's going to cause a risk and potentially an accident on your property. So you got to you got to address those weak links first. And so it's it's weak links to the micro and weak links to the macro. And so that's kind of that's kind of my approach is, you know, you keep ratcheting it up by focusing on things you're good at, things that you can do, things that you have skills for, so on and so forth, things that you have resources for. But then, and you always incrementally move those things forward, but then you always got to address weak links. And then you address these weak links in sort of a hierarchy of needs is like, well, this one particular weak link, if this isn't addressed, if we get it, like, let's say it's a, a spillway in a pond or, um, it could be, uh, you know, water is one of the weak, weakest links and biggest opportunities that we have on land. And so, you know, I was thinking about attacking those weak links on the way down. So the, the ones that are the most risky first, and then working your way down. And then once you have, once you've, once you've hammered out weak links, now you can really start going at a bunch of other things and then building it up from there. And so, yeah, that's one thing I would say is, kind of the best way to move forward for people. Um, and just trying to, I always just try to like, look at first principles. I'm always happy to talk about details too, if there's specific questions, but I think first principles is a really good way to understand things from a foundational perspective with the body and the land and even the mind, right? The, the, how you perceive things too. That's a whole other rabbit hole. A lot of your uh, latest content, you kind of touched upon it a little bit there was, um, collecting you know water harvesting and out here in wyoming that is for anyone who's a rancher that's going to be a, a huge priority we don't have a lot of uh water that you can you know dig down into um to put a well um and we don't get a lot of rainfall each year are you collecting yeah. all the water that you and your family is drinking uh, that would be my first question and number two do you have to treat it with anything and if anyone uh hasn't seen his property uh go to his uh his ex um account it's so beautiful um but yeah question about just the, the general water what you guys are doing yeah well now we're really at a state of sovereignty you know um in the sense that i have multiple sources multiple places to store it uh and it's totally decentralized which is really cool and 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 once I complete another construction season, I'll have a whole other completed level of decentralization. So um, one, so, so when we first got here, all that was here was a, a seasonal pit well that captured snow melt and some precipitation at a certain point. It didn't, wasn't really effective during the growing season. The, the level of precipitation would, that you'd need to collect in this little watershed is is a lot of the rain in the fall so we get in our we're in a sort of a boreal climate uh you guys are a, a semi-arid steppe climate what's referred to it's very different from here so we're in a boreal climate um we're dry for the growing season but we get a mat we get all of our precipitation in the winter 
pretty much. I mean, we get a little bit of rain in June, um, and then that's it. And then the odd periodic rain throughout the season, but very little. You can't count on it at all. And then we get massive amounts of rain that start in October, and then that just leads into snow in the winter. And then we get about 10 feet of accumulated snow um, over the winter. And then it's that melt which is my biggest opportunity to capture water. And so the first system that was here was this 12 foot culvert pit well. You guys know what a pit well is? Uh, no. So it's just, okay, a pit, a pit well, uh, that's what it's often referred to, is a well that captures surface water. Because there's two kinds of water, really. There's surface water, which is everything that comes out of the hydrologic cycle. And then there's groundwater, which is tapping into fissures, aquifers, things like that. They're two different things, and they're two different types of water. Um, and so, so the first well that was here was a pit well. It's a culvert that's dug down just with a machine into an area where water naturally settles. So, you know, water settles in valleys, riparian zones, things like that, right? You see those geographical top, topographic features where there's a depression in the land. It's where things are green. So that's... The first place you look when you if you're looking at land to get water and so they just dug this pit well here and then it just fills up in the ground because it just settles there and then that culvert fills up and then you can pump from that culvert because the culvert naturally separates this the earth from the water and then it just fills up and so you pump it down the culvert drops down but then it kind of fills its way back up just from the negative pressure as, as you've taken it out and so that's what they had here at first and then they had this little simple watershed it's like a it was a little shed basically built on a foundation that is a cistern so it's a forty thousand liter uh cistern which is enough for a single guy who lived here for a long time to get through a winter of water with showers and washing dishes and drinking and all that stuff but for a family of four it wasn't even close so so that was here so i used that we're still using it because we're, we're not our house isn't finished and we're not fully in our system yet um, and so we used that, but then what I did next was I drilled a well. So I, I had talked to a number of guys that did water witching, water dowsing. If you're familiar with the, the, the steel rods, it works. Um, and it worked for me. And so the, I, I connected with the previous, previous owners of this property who said that they had a, they had a guy, a water dowser guy come up years ago. And they said, there is a spot where if you drill, you will get water for sure. So I doused it and they crossed and I was like, okay, this is the spot. And it was serendipitously right behind my house, the house that we're building. This, this building I'm in right now is part of that. And so we drilled a well 375 feet deep through solid granite, straight granite the whole way. And we hit 10 gallons a minute, which isn't a ton of water, but it's, it's enough. It's enough for what we need here. It wouldn't be enough to run, say, 100 acres of grazing, but it's enough for our, you know, our inner eight acres of this homestead. We're on 40. And so I did that. Then I started decentralizing the storage. So then I start. I, ha I was able to pump from there. I can send it in different directions into those cisterns I explained earlier, but also I built another cistern system 100 feet above to do a gravity feed into the general property. So then I did that. Uh, then I dug two ponds this summer. And so now I can capture the snow melt and rainwater, but I can also fill those ponds from either source, either of those two wells, the pit well or the, the dug well or the, the, the drilled well. Then once I finished my house, which is at the lockup stage right now, call it, now I can harvest massive amounts of rainwater. So I started setting up, I've got a cistern next to the house there that captures all this. I can collect 10,000 liters in a day just with medium rain. And so now I've got that and then I can pump that back into my ponds. So as it develops, it's getting more and more, um, it's getting more diversified. So there's more redundancies in it. And that's kind of where I'm going. So once I finish the house, I'll have another, it might be a hundred thousand liter cistern that collects just rainwater, but I could also pump any other source because I, I do it all on a single line. I can pump anywhere into that line or off that line. And so I have to manage how that goes, but I could basically have all these systems holding stored water so that let's say it's an EMP and I'm wiped out of electricity. I don't have electricity. I can go and get water from any of these sources in the, in the coldest time of the year without any power. 
And so that's kind of where it's going. And there's also a huge fire suppression element to all of this too. That's why having decentralized water sources is really important because if you have a fire and all you have is a 10 GPM well, you can only pump from one place at that amount of water. But if you want a fire and you want a fire hose, you want 30, 40 GPM. So now I can achieve that because I could go and run pumps from those other sources and defend a front coming from many different um, positions. With the water har harvesting off of your roof, what do you use for um, the roofing like material? You know, Trish and I are always worried about leaching and some people collect it with the shingles, which I know have tons of chemicals in it. And then a lot. Of yeah, I don't do that. Yeah, yeah it's all I, I, my roofing is all exclusively standing seam steel. Yeah. So standing seam is the most expensive steel roofing, but it is the best because there's no bolts and, and has a way of it locks over the last bolt and then it, it locks in there. It's really good for snowy climates too, because it, it sheds snow better. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what it is. It's all steel. And so I don't, and, and, and to your question earlier about filtering, I don't fil I don't filter our water. Um, the water we drink, we prefer to drink um, from the deep well because it's high mineral it's mm -hmm. totally pure it can't be poisoned by anything even the sky and so that's what we drink and then i irrigate with everything else i also irrigate with that water too but i don't filter it i just i add some salt to it to soften it we have a water softener because the water is so hard that it's mm -hmm. it is hard on equipment mm -hmm. pumps and things like that but um yeah that's great i think yeah, a lot of people they treat, they filter like so many aspects of the of their water. I think it's kind of a shame when you, especially when Well, there might be a need to, right? Yeah, there might but, be but... a need, especially if it's like like you said, um if they're spraying a lot of things in the area. And... Yeah, or if you're down if you're getting groundwater downstream from a big conventional feedlot. Yep. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Drinking glyphosate, yeah. Exactly. That. So That's us here. Yeah, oh really? Yeah, it's tough, but yeah, I guess water in general, it's becoming more and more of an issue. Do you do you fear that there's going to be like some government regulations more coming in terms of how much water you can capture or or anything like that? Because I think the well, water is kind of just getting stuck. I, I don't fear government regulation because I read their documents and I, I there's always remedy. And so I don't fear any of that uh, because none of that stuff has standing. It only has standing when you give it authority and don't do your research. So I don't fear that stuff, but, but yes, that is coming, but that's coming for the people who are ignorant. And then, and so there's ways around all this stuff. If it doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter what state you're in. If you're in a Western law, there's remedy for all that stuff. You just have to do the work. And so I don't fear that, but yes, it is, it is coming. Uh, you know, when you read the agendas, the UN agendas, 21 and 30, um, this they exclusively they talk, they talk about that stuff they talk about regulating people off the land because they want to push it right into cities and so that's yeah we're, we're going to be in that situation the, the world economic forum has already expressed that well we couldn't get people scared and corralled enough with climate change so we need to do water now and so yes they're going to push this water scarcity narrative um, they can geoengineer it, they can make a place a desert, or they can make a place a tropical climate with with just, you know, throttling the uh, aluminum and barium they spray in the sky, which the US and Canada on the record do. That's all, you know, um, documents that are easy to find. And they the technology is there. And then they can use a thing called harp, and they can manipulate the weather patterns. And you know, the weather, the weather, for the most part is completely controlled, as far as I can observe. So yeah, that's all coming, but that's why it's important to drill. Um, and when it comes to, you know, uh, registering your wells, you don't have to do that. You know, that's, that's what I, I just didn't register my well because to register is to give authority to another party. And so just do your well and don't tell the government <laughs> you're not legally obligated to, um, they'll tell you in some roundabout way that you are, but you're not. Um, especially for you guys in the US, there's just so many ways around these things that, you know, you don't have to listen to anything they say. But yes, everybody should have <laughs> at least two sources of water. That's when we, cause we, we we run a program called the Homestead Accelerator. We we help people get on the land. We, we, we evaluate properties. 
mostly in the US, all over North America, call it 5% in Canada, 95% in the US. We don't list a property unless it has two sources of water. So it has to have a well and a pond or uh, rainwater catchment and uh, you know residential water, whatever combination it could be. It's got to have two sources of water. So I, I think it's absolutely critical, especially in a place like Wyoming, where it's a tough place to live. I mean, Wyoming, before technology, a lot of people didn't live in Wyoming, you know, even though if you look at the tribes, uh, the uh, Native American tribes that lived there, they, they passed through, you know, they, they moved through those areas, they didn't have settlements there in much in the same way that you do other climates. And so, yeah, you need to be very serious about water in there. But you can do it. I mean, you can do capture snowmelt capture is probably the best thing in a place like wyoming doing earthworks to capture snowmelt uh because you just don't get the rain you know you get like 10 inches of rain or less in some of these places of wyoming but i i'm the same thing i get 10 inch, i get 14 inches of rain here which is nothing but i get 10 feet of snowmelt which is for what my main draw on my property which i've got i, I have a re, uh, call it a catchment pond there 10 million liters of water move through that catchment and i can only hold maybe half a million in that pond but i can as it goes through that pond i can keep pumping it uphill to my other pond my cat my uh, reservoir pond which can hold about twice as much water and i can put it in other places and then i can use it to irrigate the property and there's so many ways to hold water and slow water down and and yeah that's what it's all about yeah, when you kind of read a bit of Wyoming history, it's, it is a lot of people, as you said, passing through to sort of make it to um, the West Coast and the Oregon area and things like that. Uh, it's quite an inhospitable landscape, a lot of it. It's like Mongolia, I always say. Um, it is, yeah. Well, can you talk about the 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 water witching? What were you saying with that? It, it almost reminded me of something in like um, East of Eden where they were using um, like some sort of metal yeah dowsing yeah, water dowsing man. it's it's legit yeah. yeah you get you just get two steel rods it doesn't matter uh where you get them from um i had a bunch of what were they i think they're about three foot long four foot long i think it was 15 gauge steel rods that i use for little mini hoops that go over my garden and so as an agricultural product, I just bent them into an L. So there's a handle and, and you just, your body is an antenna, you know, your body, our bodies are mostly water. And with the energy within our bodies, it somehow shows you where water is. Apparently it doesn't work for everybody. Apparently women can do it easier than men, but uh, men can do it. I mean, all the water dowsers that I met, um, I've talked to about, 12 different dowsers and water drillers that have been doing it for 30 years i always just i call people and i just ask questions and so it's not always content that i make i just i'm that kind of person i'm inquisitive and i interviewed a bunch of these guys before i drilled my well because it cost me twenty seven thousand dollars to drill my well it wasn't you know that's what that's not chump change and so i wanted to really have an educated perspective on what I was going to do before I was going to invest. And so I did the water dowsing. You, know, you basically walk around. And when you get to a point where there might be a fissure in the water, the, 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 the rods cross. So you kind of hold them level and you just walk around and you see the move. It's really trippy. Cause you're going like, I'm not moving this. This is crazy. <laughs> and so I, I, I did it. I went to a number of points and then I put flags on those points. And then I just, I talked to a bunch of, at the time, this was during all the COVID lockdowns. Um, I had a really hard time finding guys that would come and drill for me because they were all so busy. Everybody was so busy. You couldn't get anybody. And I had, anyways, I called a bunch of them and just, if they couldn't help me, they were friendly enough to just answer my questions. And I asked a bunch of these guys, I was like, you know, kind of come up, try to come up with some kind of consensus of how underground water works, because we really don't know much. Humans don't know much. We can only go down so far. But I talked to all these guys and every single one of them, actually only one of them said that in their entire career of 30 years, they hit a duster where they drilled and drilled and drilled and just couldn't hit water. The general consensus with guys that are in the water 
earth groundwater space is that you will eventually hit water if you keep drilling. Yeah. And so I said, okay, well, then it just becomes a question of how much money do you have until you have to stop drilling? And so the day that I drilled, it was, yeah, three years ago in the summer, it was July, had these guys up here. They had they spent a half day just setting up, getting the rig going. They started drilling down, maybe got, you know, 50 feet until they shut her down for the day, went to a hotel, and then they come back and they just drilled. And so we drilled a full two days, no water. Okay. And I'm just I'm just watching the clock and watching the money going <laughs> like holy crap. I was already I was already twenty thousand dollars in and no water. And so this at, we were at it was something like through 250 to 275 feet, no water. And he's going, well, you know, I only have 500 feet of pipe. It, and he's like, but we can, like, I, we, we could basically hit 500. If we don't hit water, you could do two things. You could either decide to drill somewhere else, which I would probably not advise to do, or we can drive back to our base of operations and bring another 500 feet feed a pipe here leave all the infrastructure here take a trailer go get the pipe come back and drill more we could do that i said okay well you know i'm not going to stop now because if i stop now what if the water would have just been another 10 feet right and so i was basically ready to go the long haul it's like keep drilling keep drilling at 300 feet we we hit a trickle and he's like okay there's about two gpm here that's not a ton do you want to go further i'm like yeah just go because if i don't have water I don't know. I don't have anything really. You can't, you can't be on a homestead without water. And so, yeah, at about three sixty, it was just like, boom, just like water coming out, hit 10 GPM. And he's like, yeah, we'll, we'll just go, we'll go deeper. And then we'll get to a point where there's a good static level of water. And so we did that. And so we stopped there and, um, yeah, it was amazing. It was funny too, because the previous owners, oh no, the, the, the previous, previous owners of this property, drilled a well um 50 feet and didn't hit anything and then they just stopped mm. whereas they probably could have just drilled another 100 feet and hit water but they left that well casing there and everything and when i first bought this property i thought there would have been some water there there wasn't i pumped it and it was there was nothing it was just some standing water in it very little so yeah the, i think the thing with water is like You'll find this too in places like Wyoming is Wyoming. I, I've seen this because I've been all over the United States, Wyoming, uh, New Mexico, Montana, um, Eastern North Dakota, or no, sorry, Western North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, uh, Western Colorado. You look at those plains, those high elevation plains like you referred to as Mongolia. It's very much the similar climate. You can hit and even, even parts of Arizona, you can hit in crazy groundwater, crazy groundwater that will just change your world. Because if you don't have that, um, you really don't have much because you can only, especially Wyoming and, and sort of, you know, Colorado for the most part, or Montana, sorry, there's only so much you can get with snow melt because you don't even get a ton of snow there. You don't, you, you might get, I don't know, what do you get? Five feet a year, maybe less. Yeah, I'm not sure we're on the rain shadow side. So yeah, it does get all caught up in in that's the, the thing. You're on the rain shadow side. But you yeah. know, you'd be surprised what you can find for groundwater. You just got to drill. Like I said, all these guys I talked to, they said in their career, only one of those guys, I talked to 12 different guys when I was interviewing people for this. Um, I wish I would have made content about it because it would have been really good content. But but sometimes people just don't want they just want to talk. They don't want to be on video, you know. But anyways, only one guy said he ever hit a well that didn't produce. And, and and so they all just said, if you just keep drilling, you'll hit water. Because the stratas underneath our feet, we can't even comprehend. Because we imagine everything in this sort of three-dimensional but two-dimensional way. Like we kind of think about water two-dimensionally in the sense that it just follows the path of least resistance and just goes down. And we we look at these rivers as this flat plane and it just kind of follows topography going down but under the earth it's three-dimensional it's all over the place it, it the, the the water under in the earth doesn't follow the same physics that it does on the surface because it's not bound by the same physics it's it's different there's no there's no air sometimes you know 
what I've experienced is that the higher on the mountain you are, the less you have to drill. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So for example, my neighbors are all 400 feet in my area. I, I'm the only one in my little area that, that lives on the mountain. Everybody else lives in the valley. Their wells are all minimum four to five, actually 500 feet deep for two GPM. Okay. I'm 400 feet above them. My well is shallower at a higher gallon per minute. This doesn't make any logical sense. If you understand the hydraulic cycle and the way it works, that just defies logic. But it's just because we just don't know shit about what's in the earth, basically. And you're upstream from everyone then, too. So to me, that sounds like a win-win. And the doubt. Well, maybe, uh, maybe I'm upstream. Maybe not. Oh yeah, maybe because, not. Mm. But because it could yeah. be completely, I could be tapped into something that they're just not tapped into. Yeah. Because my my well has no seasonality to it. Where all my neighbors' wells, there's seasonality to them. So they're deep in a valley, water settles, and it just sits there, and it creates what's called a plume underneath the earth. And then it, it in a way, makes reservoirs in a way. Deep groundwater, or if you've ever looked into primary water, it doesn't work like that at all. It's sometimes the pressure is pushing up. Like I've got a buddy who lives about uh, 20 kilometers from me, he has a, a, a um, an artesian spring. I going to say, it's just almost like I mean, out of the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it just run all year. It just comes out of the mountain. It's a <laughs> river that comes out of the mountain. How does that make sense, right? Whereas the guy below him is on the river and his water function is completely different. So it's, yeah, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite a interesting subject to, to kind of go down the rabbit hole on. Yeah, I was just gonna say the dowsing stuff is is pretty cool. I, I I started researching about geopathic stress zones, and it's all like yeah, harmonic frequencies. So that'd be fun to kind of like yeah. do an experiment on. But that's kind of the consensus here in Wyoming is you know anyone can find water. It's just how much are you, how much of a check are you willing to write in terms of how deep you want to go. But it's that's, definitely you know that's you know what though that's a, it's it's the question. What is the check? But then the, the answer is do you want water or not? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, like so you, it's need like, for, you need it. You need it. You cannot, it, it, it's like water really is number one because mm -hmm. there's not water there. You can't do anything. There's a lot of things you can do to get water. And that's that's the risk I took when I bought this property because I the, what I paid for this property was half to a third the price of what other properties like this were going for. And the reason it was so cheap is that there wasn't, an established source of water. The driveway was a bit nebulous and there was no power here, but those things were fine for my context. That's again, that's why I always go back to the context, set your foundation of what your holistic context is. And then, then, then create your life script from there essentially is that I wanted to be off grid. I wanted really good privacy. So the driveway and the off grid thing didn't bother me. And then the water thing I could, I looked at the landscape because I've been consulting for so many years and I've just traveled around the world and seen so many different types of landscapes. And I've been using Google earth for so many years. I looked at the landscape and I was like, I can see two main draws. So I know I could capture a ton of snow melt. That was enough for me. The drilling thing I wasn't even thinking about at the time, but I said, you know, I'm confident enough in my skills that I could utilize those things if I make some ponds and I could also leverage the pit well that was already there. And then the drilling thing was just icing on the cake. So I took a bit of a gamble. But this is where, you know, if you know how to read topography and analyze landscapes and climates, you can take advantage of opportunities on land that most people can't. And even most realtors won't even see. I think this is a, a good transition to go into your newest update or newest project on Freedom Farmers, which was... I thought this was so cool. Um, you guys help people find ranches by using all this different sort of GIS software, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So it's called the Homestead Accelerator. It started with, um, you know, I've, I've just trusted my gut with every career move I've ever made, but I had a gut, I had a gut feeling back in, um, I guess it would have been, we started making the course in November of, 2022 i had a feeling that people were looking for land and just didn't know how to 
analyze it. And I, I see this in comments and questions and emails that I get, you know, I still have a lot of people that reach out to me. And so I had this feeling that there was a niche to create a course about how to read the landscape and how to assess property. And so I built a course around that called finding the perfect homestead property. It's one of our courses on freedomfarmers.com. People can take it. And I go through 52 assessments. Mm -hmm. So I basically, I show people a framework we use the 11 scales of permanence based on P.A. Yeomans, who, who is the, uh, he's kind of the founder of permaculture in a way, but the, the unsung hero of it, because when Bill Mollison came along, he took a lot of P.A. Yeoman stuff and then created this new content called permaculture. But P.A. Yeomans was the, one of the original guys that looked at landscape. How do you, how do you break down a farm and its components to the things that you need to live? And so he came up with this framework called the scales of permanence. We use the 11 scales. His was, I think, eight originally, but there was these other guys, Eric Townsmere and um, Dave Jackie that came along and, and updated it to 11. So it starts at, it kind of goes in a hierarchy of needs. It starts at climate. Mm -hmm. Then it goes down to topography or, or, or land form. Then it goes to water. Then it goes to um, access and circulation socioeconomics and it kind of goes down the line ending with aesthetics and experience and so you evaluate land on those things and we what what i did is when i built this course i i turned those things into uh, a scorecard so you score the property you give it a, a one to a zero to four and the higher the score the more resources you have to put in so if something scores a zero it's perfect doesn't nothing you don't need to change anything and then so basically we created the scorecard and then i went and evaluated 52 properties all over the continental u.s in every different climate zone so we looked at all the different um usda zones basically we we, we stayed out of we stayed out of arctic so we went from uh climate zone three to ten and so we just went into subtropics so from basically um not subarctic, but the coldest boreal climate you could get or BSK climate to the warmest climate, which would do, we didn't go to Southern Florida. We looked at, you know, kind of central Florida because that's where most people live in climate zones three to nine, really. And so I evaluated properties all over the entire continental US in every different climate region. So properties in Wyoming, Montana, you know, Kansas, Florida, Georgia, Southern California, Northern California, uh, Western Washington, Eastern Washington, basically covering the whole gamut of all the different experiences you can have in North America. So I created that. And then I just had a lot of people reach out to us and just said, Hey, why don't you guys just do this on a regular ba basis and publish a list? And so we never thought about that. We we're like, that's kind of a good idea. We had a number of realtors reach Pretty out nice. to us and say, you should do that. And we we're like, Okay, well, let's just try it. And so we launched a beta program. We made it pretty expensive because it was actually doing this is, isn't easy. It actually takes quite a few human resources and technology resources. And so we charged 300 bucks a month for people to take our program. And each week we would publish 10 to 15 properties in the places that people were asking us for. So when we first launched it, it was making money uh, because it, it was expensive, but it was valuable for people that were, cause they were getting like, even re and it was a lot of realtors that were taking the program because we were showing them really good properties and they're like, holy shit, I wouldn't have seen this otherwise. So this is very yeah. valuable. So we kind of scaled that and then we kind of proved the concept and now it's 40 bucks a month. Now you can sign up for 40 bucks a month and get our hot listings. And so now we have, actually, if you give me, um, can I share my screen here? Yeah, check this out. Yeah, you should be able to. Yeah, we should look at a demo of Wyoming. That would be fun. Yeah, so well, I don't know what's in, I can't guarantee what's in there right now, but this is our our software and so we use Google Earth and then we use a bunch of other climate uh metrics, you know, we're looking at uh all the climate data, we use the FEMA maps. So we don't publish any properties that are in FEMA zones. So if they're in hurricane, tornado, earthquake you name it if they're in any zone that's risky we don't publish it and so basically yeah we got a couple of places in wyoming right now here but this is what it looks like on the back end and so people can pay 40 bucks a month and they actually for 40 bucks a month they get access to all of our courses so you actually can get 
you know, we have 20 plus courses in here that people can uh, watch here. Actually, I'm probably not going to, oh, no, there it is. So we have all these courses so people can pay monthly and get all this stuff. Um, but you know, and, and all those courses are extremely valuable because we show you how to make money doing regenerative agriculture. I only teach about three of these courses. Most of them are from other content creators. Dakota Cohen, one of our newest ones, um, created a permaculture masterclass in there. But yeah, on the property side, basically we have this map that when we go and do an assessment, I have a team that go and batch properties. So we have a criteria. It's got to have two water sources, can't be in a FEMA zone, um, can't be close to any major metropolitan areas, can't be off a highway, um, has to be somewhat, um, uh, it can't be too visible. So we we favor properties that are in rural areas, even over peri-urban areas, because peri-urban areas are where most farms are. But we actually favor properties that are a little bit further out that have less visibility are closer to natural surroundings like there's more trees we rarely list uh properties that are right in the middle of an agricultural zone we don't because then your risk is glyphosate you're mm -hmm. surrounded by farms that are spraying god knows what and you're drinking or breathing in those chemicals so we we, we favor rural stuff and yeah, basically, you know, you can go on our map and all of these are all listed. These are live listings that we update it every single week. So we add 10 to 15 properties every single week. It's all based on where people are asking us in our program. And then we feature those properties. So we do a, so we go through that criteria. My team, we go through, we'll, we'll, we'll scan 200 properties that went to a short list to get 10 on the list. And then I often do the last elimination, though my team is getting really good at this because we're using Google Earth, all those other resources. And then I do the final assessment. So every single one of these properties in here, I've reviewed it and there's a video review. So you can click on this little one. This is a neat little property we saw in Kentucky last week. We normally look, we normally prefer larger acreage too. Like I, I tell people, if you want to really homestead and be hardcore off grid, you need at least 20 acres. Mm -hmm. but we had a lot of our members that say, well, just can you, maybe you could start showing us stuff. That's not what we call an a property, which has everything you need turnkey. So we started going down and actually we started doing properties like this, where it's small, it's cheap. And it's kind of an opportunity for a couple young people might say, Hey, you know, it's not a big acreage, but this property is kind of neat because it actually has a lot of what you need on six acres. Kentucky is the best place in the U S to buy homesteads right now. Hmm. And so we'll show properties like that. And then, and then I'll have basically click on this and then it basically shows my review of the property. I go through, you know, I, t I analyze everything there and then I get on, then I get on the Google earth. I talk about how the property's laid out. I look at, look at everything. I analyze everything for food, water, energy, shelter. And uh, yeah, that's basically what we do. We just kind of show people all this stuff. And it's a, it's an insane resource for, for people because if you're looking for land, this will save you years of screwing around. Because like I said, all these listings are live. We have to update it every week. We go back, we have a big master spreadsheet. And then uh, one of our guys, that's his job is every single week, he has to take things off that have sold. So everything, every listing in here is live right now, basically. That's really cool. Um, yeah, wow. I mean, 40 bucks a month, even from the courses perspective, I think that would be tremendously worth it. But I think it might be a good idea. I was just obviously thinking about what your requirements are. If you need to have two sources of water, you know, say in Wyoming, that that pretty much never exists. But, you it know, does if, sometimes. if you're willing to, yeah, it's sometimes, but if you have like that bargain rating, like, hey, this is X property, it looks great, but you're probably going to have to spend 20 to 50K on a well. That's just- And that's yeah. what I do. And and we do that. So we, Amazing. we, you know, like I said, when we started it, we said only A properties. And, and an A property is essentially a property that would sco score between zero to 20 on our co uh, on our 11 scales of, per of permanence. And then a B property would be something that's like, 21 to 40 and then a c property would be 40 and beyond what we do now is we do all of them but we just tell people what they are so mm -hmm. it's an a property it's a a b property it's a b property so on and so forth 
and that represents the amount of resources required. And I go through that. Like when I do the video analysis, I'll say to people, look, this only has one source of water here, but I see potential for sources here and here. You might expect to spend this much to do that. And and that covers everything because it's some, sometimes what makes a property really shitty isn't its sources of water. It could be its access, you mm -hmm. know? And so we, we're forthcoming with that, with those things. And we try to look at things that are just realistic for people to do. And so sometimes, you know, this is why we generally don't look at raw land properties is because you look at, you know, yeah, if you want to buy cheap acreage, sure, go buy raw land, but there's no access, right? There's nothing there. So if you're just carving and, and, and Wyoming's actually a place that's easy to develop properties that don't have access because there's no trees, it's fairly open, it's easy to do. But you're looking at properties and say, the, the mountains of uh, Eastern Washington with no access. Oh, sure. It's $150,000 for 40 acres, but there's no access. Like that, that access is going to cost you 150 to $200,000, depending on, you know, the details of the topography. But so we try to feature things that are accessible for people and yeah. Uh, Curtis, I, uh, this is going to change the subject a little bit, but I want to know your thoughts on uh on bitcoin i think tristan's a bit more of a, uh, a maximalist i'm uh someone kind of views it as the most sound uh money like option that kind of fits yeah. those properties um what what is your take on it overall i love bitcoin i i, I used to, i'm a, i'm a bitcoin maximalist now i wasn't um, at first I've always been interested in Bitcoin. I wish I was an earlier adopter. I, I, I shit the bed on that opportunity. All. You know, I, I had a good buddy of mine. Who's a, who's an absolute Bitcoin millionaire. Now, um, he's my neighbor and he lives here because I, <laughs> I got him this property and we're, we're good friends. And, um, he got me and he, he, he told me in 2014, he was like, and he was one of my first customers in my CSA program on my farm. And he said to me, he's like, dude, just spend to trust me, just spend $2,000 and just buy Bitcoin. And I didn't. And if I did, I would have been a millionaire like him because that's what he did. But anyways, I am in Bitcoin. I just cashed out. Actually, I just cashed out a bunch of Bitcoin. Uh, if I would have waited four days to cash out, I would have made another $20,000 on the amount that I sold. <laughs> so I was a little pissed off that with that, but you can never time it perfectly. But no, I'm, 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 I'm long on Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin uh, I'm long on Bitcoin and metals. I've been buying metals since I was 20 years old. So I've, I've been into that space forever. Um, but I, she, I, I, I've made more money on Bitcoin than I have metals and I've been buying metals for 20 years, right? Like it, I, I, I actually just, I did one trade. I doubled, I just doubled my money. I bought, I bought, uh, $18,000 of Bitcoin, um, last summer. It was actually, no, it was 20. I bought one Bitcoin for 25,000 Canadian, but I, I traded metals that I had paid less for. Cause I, so I, 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 I got, I had an upstroke on those metals, sold those for a Bitcoin. Then I sold that Bitcoin for 2.5, what I paid for it. So, you know, it's a pretty good way to beat inflation. And so I, I need cash right now in, in my, what I'm doing, cause I'm just spending money on my property, but mm -hmm. Um, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm big, big into Bitcoin. I think it aligns really well with, uh, I mean, everything that we talk about from a sovereignty perspective. So there's definitely a lot of Bitcoiners as well, who are trying to buy homesteads. And I think, you know, if we get a nice bull run the next year or two, that's going to be uh, a much bigger percentage that are, that are looking to buy properties. So absolutely, dude, I, I, I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I I've been kind of working on a loose, um, a, a synopsis for a, a new book I want to write that's kind of about liberty because I, I started this podcast called Liberty on the Land a, couple, a number of years ago kind of exploring what is liberty freedom prosperity how does that look like in a land-based context and so I've been kind of exploring all these things and Bitcoin's part of it because it's like how do you get liberty w what is it and, and and the money system is one of the greatest mechanisms of indentured servitude that we have right with the central banking cartels and all that and so bitcoin is absolutely and i, I my whole thing too is i just look at what can i observe with my own eyes i don't care about the hype i don't care about the spin i don't care about 
the the speculation. I just go like, look at what can I I can observe and interact with. I'm a very much like a student of David Holmgren permaculture in that regard, and I apply that same logic to truth or shit to financial stuff. And then I go, okay, Bitcoin is just delivering results. And and it's never been compromised. Like Ethereum has been compromised. Ethereum is a shit coin. It's just the most popular shit coin. But they have a board of directors. And and, and they, they, they cancel transactions. Bitcoin hasn't done that. Yeah, it's whatever, you know, Vitalik says to do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or or Joseph Lubin, you know, the, the, it's a shit coin. So I, I don't want any part of that. I sold my Ethereum. A while ago, I just went all in Bitcoin. And so I'm just, I'm hardcore Bitcoin. I think, and I read that book, The Bitcoin Standard. Mm -hmm. That kind of sold me on the last, I was already almost there. I had a number of friends, Jack Spierko being one of them was like, dude, Bitcoin is the thing. And so I kind of was convinced of that after I read that book. You just realized that when the money's broken and we live in this fiat world, everything else gets degraded completely. And I was just in Austin, Texas this past week, and I interviewed a bunch of the big Bitcoiners like Jimmy Song, Marty Bent. And it's like, yeah, their perspective just reaffirms your stance. And but it also gives you a lot of hope, right? There, This momentum, I mean, in your community, homesteading, just sovereign money, taking control of your health. Like we have a lot of momentum going right now. And I'm excited. i uh, love to send you a copy of my book as well. It's called Bitcoin and, sure. Bitcoin and Beef. But oh, I'd yeah, I'd lo I love it. You, you would love it. Uh, it's uh, you just realize it's all connected at the end of the day. So having this opt out, which you're providing from the land, shelter, homesteading perspective, and then we have Bitcoin from the monetary perspective. Like we need opt outs or else we're all just going to be stuck in the central. Yeah. And, and we need multiple ways to get paid. Like one of my yep. mentors with the law and Bitcoin actually was this guy named Steve. And uh, he always says to me, the more ways you have to get paid, the more you get paid. So I'm not an absolutist with anything. I think it's better to just be sort of agnostic with anything and then just look at its utility and then go, yeah, I can use a little bit of that. You can little bit of, use a little of this. I've bought things with metals, money, and Bitcoin, or cur currency and Bitcoin, and I think it's all it's whatever whatever works, right? I just like the idea of Bitcoin in the sense that, especially if you want to travel, or if you're going to do international trades, just nothing competes to Bitcoin. I mean, you, Bitcoin now you you can move to any country and bring all of your asset wealth with you, and you don't have to t tell anything to the the border agent or the government, right? It's, it's all yours. So yeah. yeah, I think, I think there's huge opportunity in that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's probably enough Bitcoin talk, but um, <laughs> we could, we could talk about, I, I we could talk about the water forever. We could talk about Bitcoin forever too, I think. But um, one question I had for you was, I remember years ago, I saw a video where I think you guys were talking about restoring some land where the previous owners, the, the farmers there were using a lot of pesticides, herbicides. And I think you had touched upon um, using like sunflowers and things like that. Oh yeah. Um, Sunflower. Yeah. Can you, can you talk about that? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've never done it myself, but a friend of mine, um, in Kelowna, he's on one of the oldest farms in Kelowna, and uh, it's been there for like hundred hundreds of years, and it's been in his family for almost a hundred years. They had a portion of that land that was just grown glyphosate. I think his dad, during the time of the rage of industrial farming, just got into it, and anyways, just poisoned this part of land. And uh, yeah, they found that that sunflower pulls out toxins out of the soil and then you get a harvest at the same time uh you might not want to eat that sunflower but you could use it for <laughs> beautifying things or whatnot but and, and it also produ sunflowers produce a massive amount of biomass it's actually been one mm -hmm. thing that i've done here on the property because my soil is really uh is brittle it's similar to what you see in step climates like uh, parts of wyoming and um and so i've needed to just put biomass in so yeah you can plant sunflower it pulls out toxins and then you can just pull that stuff out and get it off and just keep doing that i've seen urban farms even do that there was a place in milwaukee that was doing that years ago um but yeah sunflower in general though i mean if you have a if you have a machine like a flail mower 
sunflower is amazing because it basically grows without any nutrients in the soil yeah. and it produces a massive amount of biomass cannabis cannabis is another one of those things and so you can just plant that stuff and then flail mow it and then you just created a massive amount of biomass that you can leave on the soil and then plant into it the next year if you can flail mow it in the proper way and you know really mulch it on site so i think it's yeah one of these sort of red regeneration crops cannabis same thing because the cannabis just grows anywhere that's why they call it weed it just grows yeah and so it also produces a huge amount of biomass and if you want to just if you want to you know two things to get biomass on your land if if you're able to do it just grow hemp basically just just industrial hemp you're not growing it for the the buds or the anything else you just grow it for biomass and then just flail mow that stuff and I, I began doing that on my food forest project here is just doing that stuff for biomass it works great yeah, we were looking into hemp uh, with Wyoming base where we're making some apparel, you know, local as possible. A lot of wool things to start off, um, but we were trying to find some sources for some hemp that could, you know, be turned into an apparel. But it's so hard in the United States right now. I know up in Canada, you guys have some of the a lot more of those farms, I believe. Um, but it makes, oh, yeah. I guess, quite good clothing, too. Well, it's also tough on equipment like if you talk to anybody who's in the actual hemp business and i have um a lot of the equipment you can from other types of harvesting um like big combine harvests harvesters and stuff like that you can use that stuff with hemp but it's really hard on the equipment it, it because hemp is so fibrous mm -hmm. that uh it doesn't just break down and smash up like say sunflower does sunflower smashes up quite easy actually it, the, the the stalks seem kind of carbonous and robust because they're they're tough and stuff but when you actually flail mold them they they just go into mash really quickly hemp doesn't do it the same way and so yeah you need you need a whole other level of equipment to do industrial hemp i got a buddy who ran a pretty big industrial uh hemp operation just south of you in colorado and in, in durango colorado oh. and yeah he said the equipment just gets hammered. Like what in the same application on another farm with another type of crop, you're getting, you know, four times the, the, the longevity out of the equipment as you would with uh, hemp. So that's a thing to, to factor in. On the other perspective of just like having uh, enterprises, whether it's food or just any sort of enterprise on your on your property or homestead, what do you think is like a, a really big mistake that a lot of newcomers to homesteading make? Um, is it doing too much, you know, not focusing on kind of the easy things to start? Or what are some best practices for kind of starting enterprises on your property? Yeah, it's it, it's that what you said there is that's that's it um, to bring more focus to it though i would say well i was talking about it a little bit earlier just like going at weakest links so and then thinking about because when you get on a, a piece of land even if you're just on five acres it's quite overwhelming you know there's a lot to do and there's a lot of things every day that are competing for your attention and and your time and so because those are the things that are really limited you know, you can, you can have money, you can get money, but your time and ability to put focus on things are the things that are limited that you can't really scale. So you have to create a hierarchy of, of needs and then think about what things should I do now that solve an immediate problem now? So if I fix, if I put a culvert in the driveway here with a ditch, it solves that problem now, which is good, but it also has a long-term benefit is that now I can redirect water and I might be able to do something with that later. And so I try to think about things in that way is what can I do now that solves a problem in the here and now that, that could be a problem and could cause a big, you know, issue later, but it'll also have a long-term benefit. So I try to stack functions in that regard of my priorities is that looking at that, and I've made a lot of mistakes up here too, in that, you know, I was passionate about a particular idea or a thing. And then I wait, I, and then the, just like every problem becomes more once you open it. It's like the sort of the cliche can of worms comes in, right? Especially on land as you go, oh yeah, I think I can get this done in a day. You get in there and you're already a week in and you're going, holy shit, I didn't think that this would take this long. And so you have to understand that everything on the land is that way. And there's really no way around that. And so you have to kind of really think about that particular task. 
does it benefit you now? That's important if it does. And if it benefits you later, that's even better. So then I kind of prioritize everything that way is, you know, there's always the day to day stuff on the homestead that has to get done no matter what. But what you can sometimes do is put certain systems in to make the day to day faster. You know, one, one thing for me on the homestead that's been really important is my chore path, I call it. So the path that I walk out when I leave my home and I go to feed the chickens or change their bedding or uh, check on the greenhouse, trim the tomatoes, whatever it is um, that I have to do on a day to day basis. I'm thinking about that path that I have to walk every day. And I want to make that path have the least amount of resistant points as possible. Kind of thinking about everything like water is that water follows the path of least resistance. And every time water hits resistance, it creates friction and velocity. And so that's where you, that's where you create uh, interruptions in your flow. So my whole homestead has been de designed around my chore path in that when the way I walk out of my house, when it's finished, the house is here, that I walk out this straight line that gets me to everything in my zone one immediately with the path of least resistance. I basically walk down a staircase, walk straight out, got my chickens, I got my intensive gardens, I got my intensive greenhouses all right there. So that's, I, I design everything around that. And so, yeah, that's what I would, you know, in, in the macro of that, it's, yeah, it's eliminating resistances, but solving the problems that, that the, the weakest links first, and then kind of going from there. Because to, to say, oh, focus on this or focus on that, it, it depends on the context of your land, right? Because I, I would say focus on water, but then your, your land might have water. And so then that advice is useless to you. And on your homesteaders, you're, you're basically on like a mountain. How did you build up all that that biomass all the you know the the loam to be able to grow in it um because i'm it, most of it wasn't there right are you wasn't like, there trucking it up there because no in, in I didn't theory wouldn't the rain the erosion pull all that down yes yeah so i did a lot of earthworks uh i mean one of the things that i was fascinated about when i bought this property is like yeah you said it's it's on a ridge but it's a big enough property that it it encompasses many elements of topography. It's not just a ridge. I have elements that are an exposed ridge. There's there's gullies. There's there's uh, ponds. There was already all the there's treed areas. There's many different diverse landscapes on my property. And that's one thing I look for in properties when I look for them for people is that you have a variety of topography. You don't just have one feature because if you're just on if you're on a primary ridge and that's all you have. I would probably not buy that property. You want to have valleys. You want to have ponds. You want to have tree areas. You want to have exposed areas. You want to have a diversity of landscape. And so when I, when I saw this property, the thing that I was fascinated about is that there was all this different topography at different parts because it's 40 acres. Like it's not mm. small. But I saw all these natural uh, terraces that I said, well, if I just expand on those terraces, they can hold water and soil a lot better. So I did a ton of earthworks um, for that. And what I found was that when I went to the where the water followed, when you find wherever there's water, there's soil, because water carries minerals and, and it deposits them. And so I found two different sites on my property that one was already a natural pond. And I just made it better by digging out the material and making it bigger. I didn't have to make any dams with it or anything. We just took the material and I used it for more garden stuff here. Also the backfill for my house because my house is terraced into the mountainside. And so we used that. Um, but then, yeah, we had this other site, which was the first kind of pit that I started digging where there was a bunch of deciduous trees. And I said, you know what? This could be a pond eventually, but there's also a lot of soil here because most of my property, I can't even dig down, if I'm lucky, a foot and then I hit bedrock, but but no more than that. And so, but it was enough that I could shape these terraces to get them perfectly level. And then I had this pit where I just was able to take my 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 hoe and just reach down six feet and get soil. Mm -hmm. I had, you know, two feet of topsoil, which I separated. And then I used that to top everything else. And then I used the subsoil in there to structure all the terraces. So I had all the material on site. And that's one thing I say to people too now is that if you're going to look at developing a homestead property, and you're going to do earthworks. 
you want to, before you buy that property, if you know you have to do earthworks and do terracing, make sure you can find a pit where you can dig. And ideally, you can stack that pit into a pond as well. So ideally, it's in a place that um, might have some deciduous trees. You know, in our climate, if we if you see white pines, that's a sign of water. If you see cedar, it's a sign of water. Anything deciduous is a sign of water. And so dig in that area, separate that material, and then use it. And then develop that into a pond so that when you take that material out, now it can you can fill it with water. So that's that's what I did. And that's how I built all this stuff. I didn't have to bring any material in for it. The only time I brought material up here, which has been a lot, has been sand and uh, road crush, basically, for my driveway. That was a great point. I had not ever really even thought of that. That was awesome. All right. I think we've used enough of your time. But final question. Are you getting a Cybertruck? <laughs> no I, I i am on the list uh i don't have the money to buy it right now because i think i'll i think i'm going to sell my model x and uh yeah I, I would like to have that cyber track you know when i first saw that thing i was kind of pissed off i, I was keen because I, I i've been a tesla driver for almost six years so i had the model x for a while and when the, when the cyber truck came out i'm like I, I was kind of just stoked for anything that Tesla was going to produce as of, as, as of a truck. Cause I do like their products and um, it came out and I was like, Oh my God, that thing's ridiculous. It just looks ridiculous, but I put the 150 bucks down on it anyway. So I have one of the earliest uh, tickets for it, but I can't afford it right now, to be honest. I, I, I like it. I like where they went with it. I think the steering, all the technology in it is rad. The thing that's really appealing about the Cybertruck is there's no fender benders. And fender benders are the number one thing. If you buy a nice car, you just don't want to happen because it costs you, you know. I had a little, not a fender bender, but I dented a part of the door on my Model X. And it cost me seven grand to fix. Like, this is insane. Cybertruck, it's like, it'll just never really happen because it's steel. Yeah, I put down a hundred bucks too, whenever that was four years ago. So GTA yeah. were like, oh, maybe we should buy one and then, you know, review it, talk shit, or we love it, or then resell it. I don't know. You know, you probably make a good amount of profit, but yeah, the you opportunity might. cost is is high with uh with Bitcoin right now. So it, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yesterday I was driving back and a uh like one of those plastic gas cans just flew off the guy driving the opposite way <laughs> into the into the into the road. So I can hit him pull off the road or it, i couldn't do dodge it so it just hit the front of my forerunner but i was thinking you know yeah if you have a cyber truck it's it's bulletproof it doesn't even really it's barely dense with a gun yeah and and it's got 17 inches of clearance like my my old my toyota tacoma has 15 which is good for the bush but 17 inches of clearance is insane one thing i'll tell you though with tesla there's a number of things that suck about electric vehicles um you know, I think the pros are fairly obvious, especially for me as an off-grid guy. Electric vehicles are sweet because I can drive it for free almost year-round. Like, I've got a really sunny day today, so I'll charge the Tesla. But I get a pretty cloudy period in, in kind of November into early December. And then we get sunny again, then it's fine. But the thing is with electric vehicles is that you, if you have an electric vehicle, especially if you're off-grid, you have to have a warm place to park it. Mm. otherwise the battery just the continuously cold, diminishes the cold just ruins battery performance it does and it, and, and it has to, Canada, yeah that could be a the problem. new teslas though have heat pumps in them which mm -hmm. makes it more efficient which is good but that you know that kind of sucks um and then the other thing that kind of sucks about tesla but it's not the end of the world is their centralization with the with repairs um generally though they've it's gotten better because you can get service i go to the i go to spokane if i if i want to get anything mm. fixed on mine now which is fairly close but mm. um that is a bit of a pain the other thing that tesla does that really pisses people off who want to sell their tesla me included is that they keep lowering the price so it's hard to justify buying a used tesla now especially a model three because they're or a model y Model Y. There's a bit more of a market for Model S and Model X because there is such a price difference between a used one and a new one. Uh, and so I think I, I should be able to sell mine. But yeah, I, I want to sell it. And then 
so that I don't have two Teslas because I would like to get that Cybertruck. It's, it certainly suits my context more. The thing is that sucks about the Cybertruck though, from a farm perspective, is you can't just take the back off and put a flat deck on it like you can any other truck, mm -hmm. right? Like a lot yeah. of farmers do that, right? They pull the back off so they can have flat deck and then they can they can just throw sure. bales of hay and whatever on. It's useful. You can't do that with a Cybertruck, which I think for homesteaders isn't that practical. It, certainly for preppers, it's kind of a cool vehicle because mm -hmm. it's got the the battery range is insane. It's 123 kilowatt hour battery. Mm -hmm. Like that's 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 a lot of juice. And I heard that now you can do the reverse charge thing with them now. So, uh, with the new, with the cyber trucks, you'll be able to plug it into your system and use those batteries to power your house. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think I heard that too. I heard that, but yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen it officially announced. So, but I, I did hear that because I know that the F-150 Lightning did that. Yeah. So that truck that, really that, sucks. But... That would be cool. I was just curious on your opinion on just like, you know, from the sovereignty perspective of owning an electric vehicle, like kill switch being connected. Well, that, that that's the one thing like too. That. And, and not that all you can do a is lot speculate. Of cars kill switches too nowadays. So. Yeah. Well, I, I heard that there was going to be 2026 that that was going to start in the US officially. And I think it was only in California to start. Cool. I think it's 2030 for everywhere now, right? Biden said really ours. I don't know. It changes, but mm -hmm. it's coming. Well, the thing that's like quite unique about you, Curtis, is that, you know, a lot of homesteaders are uh, very resistant to all that technology. In fact, yeah. I think you're really the only person who uh, I've come across that has a Tesla and does the homestead <laughs> right. and, and likes them. But, you know, and I talked to some homesteaders out here, but they, I think it, they think it's the technology, but what, I guess what they don't understand is um, with the regular cars uh a lot of the new engines you really can't even work on um they're all the same today yeah no, and it's, all it's, are going to get the, it's the same problem too. so there's nothing yeah. Yeah. really you know the problem is that there i guess the overall problem is that it's a everything's becoming more of a computer and with that even the motorized vehicles they're going to be able to turn off it's kind of irrelevant it, whether that it is yeah whether, whether it's electric or gas it doesn't it doesn't really matter at this point it's just new vehicles period the thing was though there was a truck that was out and was shut down did you ever hear about the bollinger truck no it was the ultimate hardcore off grid <laughs> prepper electric truck had zero technology. Really? Mm. It was all mm. dials and switches. The inside of it looked like um, those old Mercedes uh, military trucks. It was fucking awesome, dude. And they discontinued it. Jeff Bezos mm. bought the whole company and then integrated into his Amazon fleet. But mm. this truck was going to be the truck. This this truck would have been the best uh, competition for Cybertruck, but they discontinued it. And it was, it was similar in the Cybertruck too. It looked like a Hummer. Everything was flat panel. It wasn't angular like the Cybertruck, but everything was flat panel. Everything was fixable. You could cut holes in it and do whatever you wanted to it. Uh, and it only had, it was just power and drive. That's it. There was no power steering, no computers, no nothing. That would have been the ultimate truck. And I, I, I that, that would have been the one I would have got if they would have continued it, but they shut it down. Yeah, well, there's the, startup idea for anyone who's listening is very based and uh maybe in the yeah i know but the, the thing is that your, your financing is always going to be a problem because your financing comes from big banks and they they're all on well, that's why when, when bitcoin when we exactly we run the world in 20 years and we have all the money that's where bitcoin that's where becomes game fun. changing yeah because look when, at how much cars have progressed you know the cyber truck's cool because it just is like out of left field totally different like they could be everything could be so much better mm -hmm. but the i know very system is not set up to fund that no it's not that's why when bitcoin hits a million then that's when we're talking about real financing real yeah real, real innovation DeFi. Yes, real innovation. And also, too, I mean, people have to just, we have to start just getting radical about intellectual property, too. Because you know there's so much technology out there that's been suppressed or bought up oh, yeah. through aggressive takeovers that I, like I, I think even solar and all this stuff's a joke. When you look at zero point energy and all that like kind of stuff, it's a whole and things like that. There could be totally, it's all, it, it's all there, it's all been proven. Um, but the, but the, the world elites don't want the peasantry 
having access to limitless energy and technology because then there's not a need for them. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like there's so many, everything's monopolized and and there's no real incentive to innovate. And I, I think listening to Elon Musk, it's almost like they're not going to make that much money off the Cybertruck to begin with. I mean, in the future, obviously it would make money, but um, it's based upon him wanting to do that and wanting to innovate. And even like Toyota, I love, love Toyotas, but this is, this is like, it feels like a huge jump just looking at it. Yeah. It's a huge jump, which is sometimes needed, you know, and that that's one thing that I, I don't, like I said, I'm just kind of neutral on Elon Musk. And I just try to base my, my opinions on the observations and things that I can actually experience, not speculations, not what somebody else says about him is that he makes good products. Like Tesla's a good product. Mm -hmm. Twitter's a really good product. Twitter, Twitter's a way better product now than it was, mm -hmm. you know, um, Starlink. I couldn't do this stuff without Starlink. It's a really good product. The 2.0 version is way better than the first. I had the first and it wasn't that great. It always cut out on me and it took a lot of electricity. The new one is on, they sent it to me for free. It's just like, here, here's the new one. Boom. Yeah. The Starlink, the Starlink is incredible. And your connection it, is really good. It's pretty good. Yeah. It used to always drop out. And so now it's a lot more consistent. So, you know, hats off to him for that too. Yeah. It's like, it's incredible. It's like one guy pushing all of this. Obviously, he he uh, it, you know creates an incredible team around it. But um, the yeah, only thing crazy. about the, the Cybertruck too is um, what about like the weight? As far you know, like a Toyota Tacoma, I don't think is that heavy. So it's like good hell no. My stuff. Tacoma's light. My right. Model X is so heavy. It's crazy. yeah. That's gonna be with the thing with the with the the Cybertruck though. As, as you know, if you did bring it on a homestead, it's in, gonna be incredibly heavy. I mean. You, I can, I, you know what, as a guy who lives in a pretty like rugged area, uh, I think vehicle weight is a, is a pretty good thing, especially in winter conditions. Like I have, um, studded tires on them on my model X and that thing crawls better than my Tacoma in really rough conditions. The ground clearance isn't as high, but I, you can jack it up, right? Like that has the air suspension. So you can just tell it to jack up. Um, and so then it can kind of crawl like a, say maybe a Highlander or something like that. Um, so the weight is, is pretty good. I mean, yeah, it might, it might be dicey when it comes to crossing little bridges or things like that, but I don't know from, from what, from what I've experienced, the weight is, is, is better actually. Cause then the vehicle is just so stable. It just won't roll. You mm -hmm. get stuck. You get, get stuck as often because your weight distribution is so low and even, with all wheel drive. Like I just, I've never got that car stuck and I've, and I've, I've taken it in places that my Tacoma goes. Yeah. I don't think you can even flip it. The, the side no. because it's so bottom heavy. So bottom heavy. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right, man, that was awesome. We thank you for your time. Maybe we'll go up to BC sometime to ski. We're on the icon pass. So if we do, we'll have to uh, reach out. Yeah. Let me know. I don't, I don't know if they'll let us in because we're not vaccinated, but no, that, 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 none of that. That's, that's all gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's we'll have to connect it. on post more on Twitter. Definitely reshare your content and collaborate. I think this is a great conversation to have. It's so important for people. I just, I, I love talking to experts because it's intimidating really to get yeah. into all this. Yeah. You just got to get started and kind of fake it till you make it. That's what I did. So where can people find you? What is your Twitter X handle and any other places you want to point them to? Yeah, two places, really. I mean, I'm easy to find on YouTube, uh, Off Grid with Curtis Stone. On Twitter, I'm at uh, Off Grid Stone. And then freedomfarmers.com is the best place. If people, I'm consulting again, too. If people want to consult with me, they could just go to the urbanfarmer.co and then there's a like a consulting page in there. You can just contact me through there. Um, yeah, those are the best places. Awesome, man. We'll see you on X and Rumble. All right, boys. Thanks take care. Thanks so much for hopping on. Have a good one. Yeah. Okay, take care.